snow piles against the stone wall. The wind howls through a horn window. A single monk, alone in the 14th century, kneels in a cell of stone. No fire, no wood, no light, just breath and faith. Now imagine trying to sleep through that storm when even the air itself wants you gone. No heater, no blanket, just a man. And the silence of a frozen world. But he didn't freeze, he didn't die, he slept warm. How? How did a man with nothing but stone and straw beat the cold of a blizzard? Tonight we uncover seven real survival secrets techniques so simple, so brilliant, they kept medieval hermits alive when nature itself tested their faith. Primitive, maybe, but it worked. Think of the coldest night you've ever known, the kind of cold that seeps through stone and skin until it reaches the bone. Now imagine living in that every day. The hermits didn't live in castles. They lived in cells of stone, small, dark, no higher than a man could stand. Walls thick as a man's arm. Ceilings low enough to bow your head without meaning to. Outside, the wind screamed across the valley. Snow clawed at the windows. Inside, nothing moved. No fire, no wood, no blanket. And yet they lived. They prayed. They slept. Warm enough to wake and begin again. Archaeologists at Fountains Abbey found something unusual. Many of these monastic cells were built half underground. Their lower walls sunk deep into soil nearly three feet thick. What looked like a dungeon was insulation. The earth itself became a heater, holding a steady 50 degree, even when the air outside dropped below zero. The design was simple, a packed earth floor, a ceiling under two meters high, and a narrow vent for breath. Just enough for life, not for wind. No sparks, no smoke, just warmth rising slowly from the ground. Inside, the air stilled. The wind stopped at the door. The silence held heat. They had no chimneys, no fires roaring in the dark. But they had something better, patience. A rhythm between man and earth. Today, engineers call it earth-sheltered architecture. Back then, it was something holier. They called it faith, and the ground itself answered. No fire, just warmth and silence. He didn't light a fire. He let the earth keep him alive. But as the storm dragged on, even the ground began to lose its warmth. So he turned to the only thing left, the dry breath of summer, woven into a bed of straw. You know that kind of cold that doesn't just touch your skin, it crawls. It starts in your feet, climbs up your legs, and settles somewhere deep, like a slow ache inside the bones. That's what the hermits faced every single night. No mattress, no feather bed, no down, no comfort, just a pile of dry straw and faith. The stone floors beneath them stole warmth faster than fire could make it. Lie down without protection, and within minutes, your body temperature would drop like a falling stone. So they learned to fight back, not with fire, but with grass. Old manuscripts like Payas de Pellerin describe a simple, brilliant trick. A 30-centimeter layer of straw packed tight under a sheet of linen. It acted as a wall, a quiet natural barrier between man and frost. Tests on similar straw mats show they can raise sleeping temperatures by nearly 20 degrees Fahrenheit, even in unheated stone rooms. It wasn't soft, it wasn't fancy, but it was warm. Every week they changed the straw, the old flattened damp and tired, the new crisp, dry and golden smelling faintly of summer, crackling softly like autumn leaves under your back. When you lay down, the straw whispered, a soft rustle, half lullaby, half reminder that you were still alive. That sound was warmth itself, a rhythm between the earth and the human heart. No fire, no blanket, just the trapped breath of summer stored in hollow stalks, waiting patiently to give its warmth back in winter. Modern builders would call it insulated bedding. The Scandinavians still use it in remote cabins today. A genius born not from wealth, but from need. Proof that sometimes the best heater is humility. Not cozy, but warm enough to dream. And for a hermit, that was enough. If you've ever felt that kind of cold, the one that creeps in even under blankets, you know what they faced. 
Have you ever found warmth in something simple? The straw whispered through the night, warm but fragile. Every rustle said the same thing, not enough. The cold still crept in from the walls, from the air, from everywhere. So they built something tighter, a shelter within a shelter, a wooden chamber where breath itself became fire. Imagine sleeping inside your bed, not on it, inside it. That's how families in Brittany and the Northern Isles of Scotland faced the winter. Their homes were stone, their breath froze in midair. No matter how thick the blanket, the cold found its way through the collar, through the cracks, through the night. So they built a box, literally a bed with walls and a door, a small wooden chamber tight as a drum where a single body could heat an entire cubic meter of air to life-saving warmth. Archaeologists have uncovered dozens of these closed beds across western France. At the Musée de Bretagne, fragments of oak panels still bear traces of soot, suggesting candles once burned inside. In Scotland's Hebrides, a fully preserved box bed from the 1400s stands inside the Sky Museum of Island Life. Its panels blacken the edges sealed with animal fat to block drafts. Wool scraps found within hint that the interior was lined for insulation. Even a small shelf was carved near the headrest, a niche for a candle or a prayer book. Simple, ingenious, sacred. Step inside, slide the wooden panel shut, and within minutes, your own breath turns the darkness warm. Tests on reconstructions show the air inside stayed 8 to 10 degrees warmer than the open room. Moisture beaded on the planks, freezing at dawn, the quiet evidence of survival. Families often shared one bed. Children crawled in first, parents last closing the door, like sealing a promise against the cold. They called it the poor man's oven, built like a coffin. But it saved lives. No chimney, no smoke, just human warmth trapped behind wood and willpower. Today, architects designed sleeping pods for space stations and micro-homes. They discovered it in labs. The monks and farmers of the 15th century discovered it in silence with an axe, a few planks, and a prayer. On the wall of an old monastic cell, archaeologists found something strange, a long brown scorch mark shoulder high as if the wall itself had once burned. But there was no fireplace, no soot, no smoke hole above. And yet, the wall was warm. It didn't make sense until they looked closer. The clay was mixed with straw pressed thick, about 16 inches deep, porous, dense, perfect for holding heat. So how did the monk use it? Simple. He heated a clay pot outside over a small fire until it reached nearly 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Then he carried it in still glowing red and pressed it against the inner wall. The clay drank the heat like a sponge, and for hours afterward, that wall radiated warmth, soft, steady, silent. No flames, no smoke, just breath and earth and patience. The marks they found were the fingerprints of that heat, centuries old, baked into the walls by repetition and faith. The air inside stayed mild long after the fire outside died. A heater carved from silence. This was the ancestor of the masonry heater, a low-tech miracle that traded sparks for science. Today, we call it thermal mass design. Back then, it was just one man, a pot of fire, and the courage to wait for warmth, built from dirt and faith, warmed by both. Archaeologists still debate whether this was genius or just desperation. What do you think it was? Light was precious. In a stone cell, it meant more than comfort. It meant hope, but light had a price. And in the 14th century, glass cost more than gold. The monks still needed to pray, to read, to see the words that bound their faith. But the wind, the wind cut through like a knife. Every crack in the wall was a thief stealing warmth breath by breath. So they turned to what they had bone. At Barley Hall in New York, archaeologists found something remarkable window frames, not filled with glass, but with flattened sheets of cow horn, polished thin until they glowed. When held to the light, they were soft, translucent, like waxed paper, strong enough to block wind, thin enough to let sunlight bleed through. To make them horns were soaked in hot water, 
split pressed flat and set into wooden lattices. Simple, brilliant, durable. Inside those cells, the light turned honey gold, warm, quiet, holy. No draft, no glare, just peace. It wasn't luxury. It was survival and beauty carved from necessity. Today, we'd call it primitive insulation. Back then, it was a window made of patience and the will to let light in without letting life out. Fragile as faith, but it worked. When the temperature dropped below 20 degrees Fahrenheit, there was only one source of heat left breath. You can almost hear it. The slow inhale, the soft fog turning to frost. Every breath, a battle between life and the cold. Cold doesn't just touch you, it steals from you breath by breath. Every inhale pulled warmth from the lungs, every exhale carried hope away. But in a Yorkshire manuscript, monks left a single line of instruction, sleep within thine own breath. A simple phrase, a survival code. They would wrap their heads in linen, a thin shroud covering shoulders and mouth, trapping a pocket of air around the face. A tiny microclimate 10 degrees warmer than the frozen room beyond. No fire, no wood, just warmth, made of breath. It wasn't comfortable. The air inside was damp heavy, but it worked. Moist air trapped heat far better than dry air. Modern science calls it microclimate control. The hermits called it a prayer of warmth. Inside that cocoon, each breath fed the next. The body became its own furnace, the soul its own fire. Today, soldiers in the Arctic still do the same, breathing into their sleeping bags to warm the fabric around their face. Different century, same instinct. Faith wrapped in fabric, warmth you can breathe. Some people pray for warmth, some build it. Which one would you be? Every monastery had one room where silence met fire the califactory. It was the only place in the abbey where warmth was allowed to live. The stone walls glowed faintly from the embers. The air smelled of ash and wool. Dozens of monks sat side by side, reading, copying, praying hands over a single open flame. But wood was scarce, too precious to burn all night. When the fire went out, the cold returned like judgment. They learned to time their lives by heat. Right after evening prayers, when their bodies were still warm, they ended the day, not with words, but with motionless discipline. No talking, no stopping. They left the califactory in silence, walked directly to their stone cells, and lay down while their hands and hearts were still hot from the fire. That simple order warmth first sleep second kept their bodies from the shock of the frozen dark. It could hold heat for two to three hours longer than resting cold. Enough time to drift into deep sleep before the chill set in. They didn't waste energy, they scheduled it. A rhythm of body and faith. Today we call it thermal timing, the science of sleeping while your core heat is at its peak. Back then they just called it obedience because sometimes discipline burns longer than fire. Stillness is its own kind of warmth. The storm has passed. Snow still clings to the stones, melting slow under a pale sun. The valley is quiet now. No bells, no wind, just the soft drip of thawing ice. Inside the cell, the air is still. The straw bed creaks. A breath rises steady calm. While the world chased flames, he chose stillness. While others built fires, he built rhythm warmth in his hands, silence in his heart. He had no chimney, no stove, no glowing hearth. But he had the patience to listen to the earth, breathe the discipline to wait for warmth instead of demanding it. Every wall, every stone, every humble act of faith was a conversation with the cold, and he always answered softly. Because warmth, real warmth, was never just about fire. It was about attention, about presence, about faith. Today we have heaters insulation technology. But the principle remains the same. What keeps us alive isn't heat, it's intention. The storm ends, the breath continues, and the warmest fire was faith itself. If you found warmth in this story, the next one will take you deeper into how monks turn clay into heat. Stay by the fire.